Happy Easter. Easter Sunday has arrived, Resurrection Sunday, whatever you want to call it, it is still the same thing. This is the day where we get to finally celebrate being able to walk um, in an intimate relationship with God again, the way that it was intended in the beginning of creation, um, the first day that relationally we could we could be restored back to what it was like in the Garden of Eden, walking with God daily and intimately. Um, you know, we started this entire series with this idea that walking with someone, going for a walk, walking with someone and hanging out with them is an intimate time. It's a time where we get to see them at their best, at their worst. We get to hear their secrets. We get to hear their thoughts. Um, we, we, we create memories. We laugh together. And, and, but a lot of times we get distracted. And when we get distracted while we're walking with someone, um, we, we can't get that time back. We can't get the memories back. We can't get the laughter back. We can't get the beauty back. None of those things ever actually make a return to us because time is gone. And, and when we miss out on, on a walk, like if I were to go for a walk and be distracted with my wife, I miss out relationally. I mean, it, it hinders our relationship. And when we miss out on taking the opportunity to walk with Jesus, it hinders us on a spiritual level. It begins to erode and break down the relationship um, that, that God created us to have with him. And so when we started this series, uh, we talked about um, initially the disciples that were with Jesus. And we looked at one uh, particular story where, where they had been... Um, in, in Capernaum, and they were, or excuse me, they were leaving for Capernaum, and Jesus sent them out on the boat, and a storm came up, and Jesus came to them in the middle of the night walking on the water, and they freaked out. That scared them to death. And in the middle of that, in, in, of that instance, Jesus invited the disciples, all of them, to experience him in a way that nobody ever had and that nobody ever has since. But they missed out on it because their fear was so incredibly strong. Um, the quality of their faith was not where Jesus would have wanted it to be. And we walked away from that by saying that sometimes to walk with Jesus, you actually have to get out of the boat. Jesus calls us every single day to step out of our comfort zones and to step out into places that we never thought we would ever be, but to follow him, we have to actually get out of the boat. Their fear, just like our fear, tends to keep us where we are and in the boat. And when the quality of our faith um, starts to beat out the quantity of our faith, though, we start to experience the unbelievable. In the second week, we took a look at a couple different stories. We saw a centurion who came to Jesus and asked him to heal his servant, and Jesus, from a distance, didn't even go, just said, you know what, I'll do it. And we saw in that same week four guys who brought um, a paralyzed man and dug a hole through the roof of a house to drop him down into the house because they couldn't get to Jesus. And we walked away from week two by talking about the fact that the quality of your faith how strong your faith is, the depth of your faith affects someone else's walk with Jesus. And when we start all, taking all of those things and putting them together, we find ourselves getting closer and more intimate with Jesus himself. And in week three, um, we, we, talked, we looked at the disciples and the walk that they took with Jesus, taking them to places they never thought that they would ever go. They went from nobodies to somebodies and then back to nobodies again. They, they went and saw things and experienced things that, that they never really thought they ever would get an opportunity to. And we, we talked last week, we walked away by saying that walking with Jesus will take us to places that we never, ever expected to go. The good places and the bad places. But when we walk with Jesus, we know that he's with us every step of the way. And it makes it easier to walk through those spots. The walk that they had, that intimate level that, that they walked when they, they experienced Jesus firsthand. They saw him. They touched him. They saw him do the healings. They saw him do the miracles. They, they were there when he walked on the water. Um, their walk actually paved the way for us. The walk that they had, the relationship that they had with Jesus set a foundation and started laying out what it could look like to walk with Jesus intimately. It created a brand new norm because up to that point, no one had ever been able to walk side by side with anybody who could do the things that Jesus did. Who, who evidenced the, the side of him that was the deity, that someone who had, who had over and over and over equated themselves with God, saying that, you know, it's not I that do these things, but it's, it's, it's me doing the will of the Father. Or saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because we're the same, we're one. That type of foundation, that type of relationship drives us to something completely new. It lays the foundation for something that we, in, in all honesty, all of us as Christians, would do really, really well to remember. And I think it's so vitally important that we talk about this today because 
not only did they find themselves in the really great unexpected places, but like we talked about last week, when it came down to, to what we know of now as Maundy Thursday and, and Good Friday, the day of the crucifixion, the day of the Last Supper, um, it, it placed them somewhere, again, they didn't want to be. They had no idea it would ever get there. Um, because once the crucifixion happened, we saw a new side of them. Because see, the, the, the crucifixion absolutely rocked their world. Everything that they had experienced with Jesus, everything that they had heard him say in that moment, as soon as, he was, as, soon as they had pronounced him dead, everything that they heard, everything they believed, everything they had seen was called into question. And for whatever reason, we as human beings, and I've said this before, we like to look at, things, at the stories in Scripture, we look at the crucifixion, we look at the resurrection, and we like to romanticize it. We make it this big thing. And it is a big thing. It's a huge thing. But we look at the people, we look at the characters, and we give them this like godlike status. But we have to remember that the Bible is a collection of documents written by real people who actually lived, who would have experienced real emotions, real doubts, real fears, real, real confidences. All of the things that we experienced, they would have experienced. So when they saw Jesus die, everything that they had witnessed, everything they had experienced, everything they had come to believe about Jesus, especially Peter, started to hang in the balance. Everything that they had witnessed, everything that they saw was shaken, and they started to misunderstand. They misunderstood who he was and what his mission was, what he actually stepped foot on the earth to do. Now, we have the benefit of being able to look back over history and read all the collections of the eyewitness accounts and all the stories and everything, and we know. We know why he came and died. We know that in John 10.10, 10, he says, I've come that they may have life. We know that in, in John 3.16, Jesus says, anyone who believes in me will have eternal life. We even know that later in the New Testament, it says that, that he came to seek and save those who were lost. That was his mission. That was the entire purpose he came. And the resurrection was the thing that locked that mission in stone. Because as soon as he was resurrected from the dead, it carved into stone everything about who he was. And we know the end of the story. So for us, we look back at it and we go, well, of course he was God. Of course he was God's son. Of course three days in the grave he, was, he, he resurrected. He rose again. And that's why we're here today. But what if, what if we were the ones that were living it? What if we were the ones who were walking through it every step of the way? What if we were John and Peter? What if we were Paul? What if you were Mary Magdalene? What if you were Mary, the mother of Jesus? What if you lived through this? What can we learn from them? What can we look at and, and grasp from their understanding? If the whole purpose of Scripture is for us to be... It's, uh, Paul tells Timothy that all Scripture is good for, for reproof, encouragement, rebuking, all of the things that help build up Christianity. So if, if that's the case, then what in the world can we learn from their experience? Romans 15, chap, uh, chapter 15, verse 4 says this, Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. They had scriptures, but the scriptures that they had told the stories of the prophecies and the prophets. Their lived experience was something completely different. We have the benefit of looking back over scripture. So what are we supposed to learn from this? What are we supposed to take from it? Well, here's the thing. What we can learn is how to react when life falls apart for us. When everything that we know, when everything that we believe is shaken to its core, to its foundations. Because see, they reacted as people living through it the exact same way that we all would. And probably do sometimes. See, they reclused. They hid themselves away because they were afraid. They actually went back to doing what they used to know, what was comfortable. They went back to their comfort zones. They were confused about everything that they had heard, everything they had witnessed. And what they ended up doing was treating Jesus like he was a normal person who died a normal death. So everything that they had seen was something completely different than what we know and what we experience. So let's take a look at what they did. Let's take a look at how they reacted to the resurrection, and to the death. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 24. Um, the bulk of what we're going to cover is going to be right here in this chapter. So 
Let's go back in time just a little bit, and let's take a look and see where they're at, okay? So they're now coming in on Sunday morning, the first day of the week, just like we are. They've experienced the death. They watched him. They watched Jesus who said, if you destroy this temple, I will build it back up. He's over and over said that I and the Father am one. They've expected something. Some of them believed he was the Messiah, but they misunderstood what the Messiah was going to do. A lot of them thought that he was just going to run everybody out of Israel that wasn't a Jew. And now they come back in, and they treated him like he was a normal person who died a normal death until the end of the Sabbath. Luke, Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. So on the first day of the week, at dawn, okay, Sabbath is over. Now everybody's awake. The ladies are coming to the tomb to prepare the body. Normal burial stuff. They went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, I would be too. Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? The women were the first ones to go to the tomb to see what was going on. They were the ones who had prepared the spices, and someone said, Well, he, they must have loved Jesus more. No, it's just what they would have done. They went because they were expecting to find a tomb there. They had already tried to figure out who are we going to get to roll the stone away. I guess we'll have to ask a soldier. We'll have to get one of the guards or, or ask someone to come with a, with a big tree branch to give us some leverage to roll it out of the way so we can go in. And what do they experience? They get there. They see the stone rolled away from a distance, and they freak out, and they run up. And when they get there, they get asked the question, why are you seeking the living among the dead? As if experiencing something like that wasn't enough, It was one of these things that started a chain reaction that would move throughout the rest of the day. They got there. They were preparing for a normal burial. They were preparing for just normal everyday stuff that you do for someone who died. But what they got was completely different. What they were expecting is not what happened. And so when they got there and they saw this thing and these people said, the, the, these, these men in dazzling robes, they say, You're, why, why are you searching here? Something inside of them stirred. And for the first time since Jesus' death, they dared to hope. They dared to believe that maybe, just maybe, maybe, just maybe, Jesus really isn't dead. Maybe he did keep his promise. Maybe everything did happen exactly the way it says, and he, they took off. They run to go tell the disciples what they, were, what they had seen, what they had experienced. And while they were at the tomb... Jesus was off somewhere else doing something different. If you look down in Luke, 20, in Luke chapter 24, verse 15, we see two guys who were actually on, their road to, on the road to Emmaus, and they were, they were walking, and suddenly this guy walks up to him, and they start talking. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 15, it says, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. It wasn't some random guy. It was Jesus himself walks up, and they start talking. And, and Scripture says that the he, his, his identity had been hidden from them. They were talking. And so as they're walking through this, they're starting walking down the road. They're talking. They're, they're kind of recounting what, they, what happened. They're kind of reliving it and retelling the story to each other. Well, I saw this. What did you see? Well, I saw this. And as they're talking, Jesus looks at him and says, so, hey, what are, are you all talking about? He says, oh, have you not heard about what happened in Jerusalem? There was this guy named Jesus. And they start telling him the story. Now, now if you don't think there's humor in Scripture, you just got to read a little bit because there's so much irony and humor. These guys are telling Jesus what happened to himself. And, and it says that then the rest of the story says they, they walk all the way back to where they're going. They find a spot to stay, and he's like, well, I'm going to leave you all here. And he says, no, 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 y'all just come in and eat a meal with, me, with us. Just come sit down. And it says they sit down, they start eating a meal, and as they're talking, they're explaining this guy, Jesus, that, well, man, he was, he was a great teacher. He was, he was a prophet. But he had this unbelievable relationship with God that whatever he asked God to do, God did. It was crazy. So they sit down there eating, and it says that when, when Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and broke it, reminiscent of what had happened at the Last Supper, that their eyes were opened and they saw Jesus for who he was. And it says he immediately disappeared from their sight. Two guys who were brokenhearted, a group of women who were brokenhearted, they both 
one group gets, they don't see Jesus at all face to face, but they're told that he's alive. And another group of these other two guys, they, they're heartbroken. They're, they're trying to figure out what happened. And then Jesus appears to them, even though he's supposed to be dead. It says they take off running to go to tell the disciples what they had seen. Which is the exact same thing that the women did. Well, the disciples get the story of the women. They get the story of these two men. And they don't quite know what to think about it. They don't know what to believe. They're thinking, this is, well, but how can this possibly be? Scripture says that John and Peter took off running to the tomb. John outran him. By the time Peter gets there, John's got his head poked in. He's looking around. We don't really completely 100% know anything at this point as far as what sunk in for them. All we know is that a little while later, later in the day, in Mark chapter 16, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. It'll be on the screens. But in Mark chapter 16, um, verse 14, it says, Afterward, he, talking about Jesus, appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at a table. They're back in the same position that he last actually ate with them. They're reclining in an upper room, talking, conversing. If they're reclining at a table, they're probably eating and drinking stuff. And, and this is the part that amazes me. He rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart. This is the third time that Jesus has called them out for their lack of faith. Not for the quantity of their faith, but the quality of their faith. It says because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. These guys were terrified. They were afraid they were going to get arrested and finally, Jesus shows up and says, listen, you didn't believe them when they told you I was alive. You didn't believe them when they told you. had no hope that came and crept its way inside of you because you had heard that I was alive, that I had kept my promise. And as they're standing there, he, he disappears. Thomas isn't anywhere to be seen. They come. Thomas walks in and they're like, Thomas, you're not going to believe this. Jesus is alive. Unless I touch the wounds, I will not believe it. So he appears to him again, and Thomas is there, and he says, Thomas, feel the wounds, touch them. He says, Thomas believed. Because something inside of Thomas happened as soon as he realized Jesus was alive. Probably the exact same thing that happened as Jesus walked around for the next 39 days, appearing to probably close to 500 people. I don't know too many people that have come back from the dead and walked around for 39 days having conversations with people saying, hey, look, it's me. Here's the holes. I don't know too many people that have done that. Jesus walks around, and he gives, these, he gives everybody an opportunity to see who he is. The disciples, everybody that comes in contact with him, their faith, the quality of their faith goes into hyperdrive. They begin to experience something inside of them that stirs up, that hopefully the empty tomb and the cross and the story of Easter and the resurrection, that it stirs up inside of us. Or at least it should. Because what happens is this. As they start to experience Jesus for the next 39 days, they're given hope that Jesus had actually accomplished what he set out to do. That is a very big four-letter word. Hope. It's a huge four-letter word because Jesus, over the course of 39 days, gives them hope that he set out to do everything that he said he was going to do. He gives them evidence by walking around after being dead for three days that he actually is God's son. And every single person he comes in contact with just before he ascends into heaven, he gives them a charge. We know it as the Great Commission. He says, every single bit of authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I am now the rightful ruler of all of this. And I am taking my place upon the throne. Because I am the king of kings, I am the lord of lords, and at my name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Because it's only through me that anyone can come to the Father. So because all of that has been granted to me, everything, every single bit of that is given to me, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go. I want you to go every single place you can. I want you to go about your day, and as you're going about your day, I want you to tell people about me. I want you to make disciples, and I want you to baptize them, not just in my name, but in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Because the Holy Spirit is going to come to you. He's going to be your comforter. He's going to be your guidance. He's going to be your paraclete. He is going to stand in front of the Father testifying on your behalf that you can be seen as righteous because you have placed your faith in me. And he steps up. They start giving all of these things. And, it, and, and here's the great thing. When you really live out the story, when you are walking with Jesus, when you have this many people that are walking with Jesus and they're all telling the same story, guess what happens? Hope enters the world again. See, when we walk with Jesus, we reveal hope to the world. When we are intimately walking with Jesus, when we are building the memories, when we are allowing him to speak into us and we're absorbing what he has to say, when he's reminding us of how much he loves us, when we walk and we set our own distractions aside so that we could focus on him, it affects us so deeply inside. And we carry that hope with us everywhere we go, every single place. When we look at the people that Jesus loved right at the beginning of Sunday, they were broken. They were devastated. They were despondent and they were hopeless. But Jesus' resurrection brought hope. It brought hope of repair to their hearts and to their relationship with God. It brought hope of restoration of the relationship with God. It brought restoration. It brought hope of restoration that all things would be made new again. It brought a hope that everything that spiritually was dead inside of them could be brought back to life. It was a hope. It was a hope that they could actually find joy again. When I read through scripture, do you know what one of the first moments that I actually recognize and see actual true hope and joy? It's when the nation of Israel actually comes out of Egypt. As soon as they cross over the Red Sea and they get to the other side and Miriam starts singing, it's one of the very first most pure moments of joy and worship over the salvation of the nation of Israel. Because it was in that moment was the first time that God had ever made a way for their, for their, their, their sins, for their, for their everything to be passed over by him. So when Easter happened and Jesus became the spotless lamb that, that, that took our place, on Sunday nights, the last several nights, uh, last several weeks, we've been going through a series about Easter and looking at the role that we that we play in the Easter story and how we kind of fit and where we would have been in that situation. Um, one of the things that they say over and over again is that we have to get out of the mindset that Jesus died for us because he didn't just die for us; he died instead of us. And when you can wrap your head around the idea that Jesus, the Creator of the world, because John 1.1 1, 1 says that through him were all things made, and without him nothing was made. When you can get into your head that the creator of the universe died so that you would not have to, it brings hope. And his resurrection locks it in. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. You say, well, Tim, this isn't the normal Easter sermon. No, it's not. Because we all know the Easter story. What good is it to rehash the story if we don't learn something from it? Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we actually have hope again. And we should walk with that hope dripping off of us. So here's my challenge. This Easter, starting today, starting right now, walk closely with Jesus. Do whatever it takes. Maybe it's, maybe it's the very first time that you ever make a decision to say, you know what, I need to walk with Jesus because I need hope in my life. I need joy in my life. I need some peace. I need some comfort. But just remember, if you, if you make that, that declaration, just remember Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. It's not going to be an easy life. It's not always going to be roses and rainbows. You will have moments where you will need to lean into the cross and lean into the empty tomb so that you can remember that you have hope because Jesus overcame the world. He overcame this world. He overcame death. He overcame sin. I love the song, Arise, My Love, and it's mainly for one reason. It's because of the bridge of the song, death. Where are your shackles? Sin, where is your shame? The grave has been defeated. 
This is the message of, 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 of Easter. This is the message of the resurrection. Because of all of those things, we have hope in our lives and we have joy to experience. So this Easter, walk closely with Jesus. Maybe for the first time ever, maybe for the first time in a long time. Maybe you just needed to be reminded, you know what, I need to walk a little bit closer because I, I, I'm seeing a lack of hope in my life. Do whatever it takes. This is going to sound hard, but if it means getting rid of your phone, getting rid of your TV, getting rid of your computer, do it. Because if it distracts you from the Father, if it distracts you from the empty tomb, it's not worth it. It's too, it's too high a price. Because it will always distract you and it will hinder you spiritually. And you will be weaker. Guys, walking with Jesus reveals hope to the world. If people aren't coming to Jesus, it's not their fault. It's our fault. Because we're not living out the hope that we have through the cross. Because we forget sometimes that Jesus didn't just die for us. He died instead of us. And when we live out the hope that is seen because of the resurrection, we fulfill the Great Commission. And if we're genuinely doing it right, and we acknowledge that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, then every time we open our mouths, there should be a subtle, all hail the risen king in our words. Guys, we celebrate Easter to find hope, and we have hope because our king is alive. Our savior is alive. Our God is alive. And he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So my question to you this morning is this. Are you walking with Jesus? If you're not, my follow-up question to that is, why not? You may say, well, I don't have an answer to that. Figure it out. Because you have an answer, you just don't want to admit it. If you know what your answer is, you know what your reasons are, and you need answers to that, then come talk to me. I would love to help you answer your questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll be honest, I'm not real sure about that, but let's figure it out together. If you are in this room and you say, I need to walk with Jesus, I need to come to the foot of the, I need, I need to do something, I'm going to be right over here. And I would love to talk to you. If you're in this room and you're a believer and you say, you know what, I've walked away from Jesus a little bit too long, this altar is going to be open. Come and pray. Come get back to the spot where the distractions are gone and start walking with Jesus again. Because when we walk with Jesus, we bring hope to a world filled with hopelessness. We bring clarity and light to a world of darkness and misunderstanding. If that's you this morning, don't let the day go by without making the decision to walk with Jesus. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for, for carrying us when we're too weak to walk on our own. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the hope that it brings. I thank you for every single thing that comes from your death and your resurrection. And Father, I pray this morning that if there's anybody in this room that doesn't know you, anybody at home that doesn't know you, Father, I pray that you would stir their hearts that you would draw them in, that they would experience you for the first time like never before. Father, I pray that you would bring us back to a place where we feel like we're in the garden again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.